It is 3 a.m. in New York, 10 in Kiev, and 4 on a Tuesday afternoon here in Seoul. I'm Moon Gon Young. This is Arirang Korea's only global network. The entire nation continues to grieve for the victims of the Seoul Ferry disaster. On this Tuesday, a large memorial altar opened at a park in Ansan, the city most affected by this terrible tragedy. Tens of thousands of people have paid respects to those that lost their lives on the ill-fated ferry over recent days. Our correspondent is on site. Ji Myung-gil joins us live from Ansan Hwarang Memorial Hall. Myung-gil, uh, despite the gloomy weather, thousands have turned up to pay their respects. Good afternoon, Kanyang. This new memorial hall was opened earlier this morning, and since then, more than 4,500 people are streaming in to say their last goodbyes. As you can see behind me, there's a long line of people still waiting to get inside the memorial hall. In the morning, President Park Geun-hye visited the memorial altar to pay tribute to the victims of this Herald of Ferry. She also spoke to the victims of the relatives. This altar replaces a temporary one that was set up last week at Anzan Olympic Memorial Hall. This particular location, the Anzan Hwarang Memorial Hall, is six times larger. The altar displays 162 portraits of victims, including the 155 students and four teachers from Anzan's Tanan High School, who are either missing or dead. The relocation was to honor the victims in a spacious place and to allow more people to pay their condolences. Over the past six days, more than 180,000 people have visited the altars in the city. And, and this more permanent altar, like the temporary one before, it's open to the general public, correct? Yes, that's right. The new Memorial Hall will be open 24 hours a day for anyone who wishes to pay respects to the victims. The new Memorial Hall is run by the government and is jointly sponsored by the Ansan City and the Gyeonggi-do Province. Various government officials, including the governor of the Gyeonggi-do Province and the chief justice of the Supreme Court, paid a visit to the hall earlier today. To handle the volume of people upcoming here, more than 30 shuttle buses will be used to help people get to and from nearby subway stations. There's also a huge parking lot with room for nearly 3,000 cars right next to the altar. People who can't make it here can instead send text messages or personal letters commemorating the victims. The messages are posted up on a bulletin board so they can be read by mourners paying their respects here. This was Chim Myung-gil reporting live from Ansan Hwarang Memorial Altar. Well, it's been two weeks since the tragic Seoul ferry sunk off Korea's southwestern coast of Jindo Island, and the death toll has risen to 205 today, 97 still missing and presumed dead. We now connect live to our Connie Kim at the News Center for the latest. Now, Connie, the weather has given rescue divers trouble in recent days. Uh, any progress today? Well, the weather conditions in Jindo seem to have improved compared to yesterday with the clouds clearing up and wave heights of just 0.5 meters. However, rescue operations are expected to get more difficult starting today as the currents in the area will get stronger with speeds of up to 2.4 meters per second. To help divers in the hostile environment, authorities will attempt to deploy a diving bell this evening at around 5 p.m. Korea time, about one hour from now for the first time since last week's accident. A diving bell is a chamber that can be used as a base for divers, enabling them to stay underwater for about an hour without having to return to the surface. Now, 12 more bodies were discovered this afternoon, pushing the death toll to 205, with 97 still unaccounted for. A total of four student bodies were recovered on this Tuesday morning, presumed to be male high school students from Tanon High School. So far, more than half of the 64 cabins where the missing passengers are presumed to have been have now been searched. And uh, what about the ongoing criminal investigations? Uh, authorities appear to be casting a wide net. 
Well, the cases of the four ferry mates who have been arrested, including the vessel's first mate, known by his family name Kang, will be sent to prosecution. Kang reportedly called his employer, Tongyejin Marine Company, when the vessel was listing, time he should have spent trying to save the ill fated ferry and its passengers. Kang was also the one responsible for managing the amount of ballast water on the vessel, which is believed to be one of the factors that caused the ferry to capsize. Now, criticism against the crew who managed to evacuate is likely. To expand, as phone logs show that a crew member called Changyejin Marine Company seven times prior to their escape from 9:01 to 9:37 a.m. Also this morning, the president of the Changyejin Marine Company, Kim Han Shik, was summoned for the first time. He's being looked at for any links between Yu Byung-an, the practical owner of the ferry operator. Investigations will be conducted to determine whether Kim was involved in any business irregularities, such as embezzlement and tax evasion, in connection with Yu. And Kanye, President Park Geun-hye came out today to apologize for the government response to the Seoul ferry disaster. So, uh, what exactly did she say? Well, the president's apology came after she paid her respects to the victims of the sunken Seoul ferry at Ansan Hwarang Memorial Hall. During a cabinet meeting, President Park narrowed in on the government's poor initial response to the tragedy, saying she regrets not having rooted out long-standing problems in society that contributed to the deadly accident. She then vowed to make right social irregularities to regain public trust and make Korea a safe place to live. To do that, President Park said a national safety ministry would be created under the prime minister. Minister's office to efficiently manage natural and man-made disasters. She also called on the cabinet to begin thinking of ways to revamp Korea's safety system and come up with appropriate measures. Well, that's all for me for now. But I'll be back in about two hours with more updates. <laughs>《North Korea began live fire drills near the de facto inter-Korean maritime border at 2 p.m. Korea time on this Tuesday. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said the North has started artillery exercises in two border regions north of the northern limit line in the West Sea. Now, South Korean residents on five nearby border islands have been advised to take shelter, but that warning has been lifted since. President Park Geun-hye has ordered the South Korean military to respond firmly should any North Korean artillery shell happen to land in South Korean territory. To beef up defenses, Seoul's defense ministry has dispatched warships and fighter jets to the area. The two Koreas exchanged fire across the maritime border last month during a similar drill after more than 100 North Korean shells fell into South Korean waters. Meanwhile, North Korea is talking up its nuclear and missile programs. Amid speculation, a fourth nuclear test could be on the cards. The North National Defense Commission said the regime has the capacity to carry out something bigger than a boosted fission nuclear weapon test or new intercontinental ballistic missile launch. The statement did not provide further details, but Pyongyang took a swipe at the international community, saying its nuclear weapons program does not require approval from anyone. Well, it also said the regime uh, had a program and its program will not be scrapped under any circumstances. The statement was in response to U.S. President Barack Obama's comments last week during his visit to Seoul in which he said Washington would never allow North Korea to have nuclear weapons. Speaking of which, U.S. President Barack Obama has bid farewell to Asia, wrapping up his whirlwind tour of Japan, South Korea, Malaysia and the Philippines. One place conspicuously left off his itinerary was China. The president wanted to reaffirm America's commitment to defend its Asian allies and counter China's rise in the region. Our Connie Lee tells us whether it was mission accomplished. It's a wrap for U.S. President Barack Obama. His time in the Philippines on Monday marked the last leg of his week-long Asia tour. And here, the U.S. reached a 10-year defense deal to allow more U.S. troops in the Philippines. 
the signing of the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement and President Obama's entire Asia trip was seen as an effort by the U.S. to counter Chinese aggression in the region. However, at a press conference in Manila, President Obama said the U.S. wasn't trying to counter China, but only wants to make sure that territorial disputes are handled peacefully. We don't even take a specific position on the disputes between nations. But as a matter of international law and international norms, we don't think that uh, coercion and intimidation is the way to manage these disputes. We have the Philippines, as well as Japan and South Korea, disputes. have ongoing territorial disputes with China. President Obama, who visited Japan, South Korea and Malaysia this past week, did not swing by China. At each stop along the way, the U.S. president reaffirmed America's commitments to defend its Asian allies in the face of China's rising power. For South Korea, this means diplomatic commitments from the U.S. against the threat from North Korea. During his tour, the president also tried to press Japan and Malaysia on joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations, but will go home to Washington without any firm commitments. The 12 nation trade deal that extends from Asia to Latin America does not include China. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Korea has entered its third year of logging a current account surplus every month. Central bank officials attribute last month's surplus to firm auto and computer chip exports. Arirang News' Hwang Ji-hye has the details. Korea's central bank said Tuesday that the nation posted a current account surplus of over 7.3 billion U.S. dollars last month. That's up nearly $3 billion from February and marks the 25th straight month of surplus. Exports of goods rose almost 6 percent from the previous year to around $54 billion, helped by strong shipments in automobiles, semiconductors and telecommunication products. Imports went up slightly more than 3 percent to $46 billion. The deficit in the service account, which includes tourism and shipping, also fell, posting a shortfall of $650 million last month, compared with a deficit of around $1.5 billion in February. The nation's current account surplus has been working as a buffer for any potential capital outflow from Korea that might be triggered by the U.S. Federal Reserve's scaling back of its massive bomb-buying stimulus program. While the Bank of Korea forecasts the surplus for 2014 to reach $68 billion earlier this month, the number for the first quarter stood at over $15 billion. The central bank says the recent current account surplus trend is on track to meet its projection. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. In another sign that the local economy is on the recovery track, Foreign investment banks have raised their economic growth outlooks for Korea. The Korea Center for International Finance says Citigroup has raised its projection for Korea this year to 3.9 percent from 3.7. Now, it also upwardly revises forecasts for next year by 0.1 of a percentage point to 4 percent. Credit Suisse's forecast was positive as well. HSBC says Korea will no longer experience a long period of stagnation like Japan because there is such a low risk of deflation and the country's market share is on the rise. However, Goldman Sachs warns slowing exports and weakening domestic demand as well as a strong local currency could pose downside risks. Samsung Electronics, the world's largest smartphone maker, posted an operating profit of roughly 8.2 billion U.S. dollars in the first quarter. Well, the figure is down from 3.3 percent from uh, the same period last year, but 2.1 percent higher than the previous three months. Now, the tech giant sales inched up 1.5 percent from a year earlier to about 52 billion dollars, but that's down nearly 10 percent from the previous quarter. The company's first quarter net profit jumped about 6 percent from a year ago to 7.3 billion U.S. dollars. Samsung's IT and mobile business division, which makes up the lion's share of the company's overall revenue, 
posted operating profits of $6.2 billion. Now, the Kaesong Industrial Complex is one of the last remaining links of cooperation between the two Koreas. With an eye on boosting inter-Korean collaboration, South Korean businessmen with operations overseas plan to visit the industrial park in the coming days. Kim Hyun bin reports. The World Federation of Overseas Korea Traders Association is looking to resume economic exchanges with North Korea. The chairman of World Okta, Kim Woo Jae, along with 21 association members from nine countries, are scheduled to visit the Kaesong Industrial Complex in the north on May 2nd to discuss future investments and plans to establish factories there. Kim said the trip is designed to contribute to reunification of the two Koreas by promoting economic cooperation and hopefully revitalizing inter Korean exchanges. A total of 41 people are expected to make the trip, including the chairman of the Overseas Korea's Foundation, Cho Gi Hyung, and 13 CEOs. World Octa said Tuesday that it first initiated the plan back in February and recently got approved from the two Koreas, adding that it had given business proposals in advance to the North. World Octa is the largest overseas Korean business organization, and several firms are currently in business relationships with the North. Kim Hyun Bin, Arirang News. Chinese tourists are expected to come pouring into Korea this week as their annual Labor Day holiday season begins on Thursday. Well, the nation's retailers have devised their marketing strategies to attract the big spenders to their stores. Our UDN reports. China's three-day Labor Day holiday season begins this Thursday, and shopping malls in Korea are ramping up their marketing strategies to entice more Chinese tourists in. Malls are preparing various events, including generous giveaways and big discounts for such products as locally designed clothes and cosmetics popular with Chinese consumers. One of Korea's biggest retailers, Lotte Mall, will open a Korean wave pop up store, especially for the holiday, that will sell products related to popular Korean dramas. These efforts should come as no surprise as China's tourists have surpassed Japanese tourists, both in terms of their numbers and the amount they spend in Korea. Japanese tourists traditionally top the list when it comes to foreigners visiting Korea, but the number contracted recently due to the weak yen and strong Korean won, while Chinese tourists have been coming here in their droves. More than one million Chinese tourists came to Korea in the first three months of the year, up nearly 45 percent from the same period last year. Korea's top department store chain Shinsege saw its sales to Chinese consumers spike a whopping 107 percent in the first quarter of this year, while the country's biggest duty-free shop, Lotte Duty Free, recorded an all-time high of over 850 million U.S. dollars in its sales to Chinese visitors. That's up 15 percent from a year earlier. Yurian, Arirang News. Korean fair disaster has hit the nation hard. Everyone's thoughts have been on the victims and their families and not on the everyday routines of life over the past two weeks. Well, this is also having an effect on sales nationwide as Koreans haven't really been spending as much. The Seoul fair disaster and its impact on the Korean economy. Joining us live in the studio to give us some perspective is Dr. Kim Young Ju, our regular contributor. Good afternoon to you, Dr. Kim. Good afternoon. Now, the question has, has been out there for some time. Mm. Um, how will the uh, Seoul Fair tragedy affect the Korean economy? Right. And we are already seeing uh, some of the indicators falling, correct? Absolutely, yes. So, uh, pro mostly on the private consumption side, for sure. Uh, we hear all these different uh, you know, words and stories about how some of the concerts are being canceled, some of the cultural performances, the programs and trips are all canceled, and that's all happening. And we, every one of us uh, actually get to see these and hear these uh, that's happening. Uh, especially, I mean, on the private side, family gatherings, outings, probably a little bit less so, but uh, at least the, uh, the activities by organizations, offices, companies, 
uh, they're being canceled big time. So indeed, uh, we see the impact being felt on the tourism side, uh, you know, travels, uh, as I said, performance, uh, different kinds of sporting activities, and even movies, and also, uh, you know, theme parks and uh, consumption of alcohol, and even uh, just the uh, shopping side, uh, everyday, everyday necessities, they're saying uh, it's slowing down, especially in a higher end of the, uh, you know, private consumption, such as uh, department stores. Uh, they say uh, their sales are off. Uh, some of the uh, uh, experts have checked the numbers, and during the first week that followed the, the disaster, they're talking about major uh, department stores in Korea showing like a 1% to 2% drop in their sales as compared to a normal week. And overall economy, the concern is growing because uh, some of the marketing activities and many of the marketing activities and advertisement activities are being canceled or postponed because they don't just want, they just do not want to present this kind of uh, positive, uh, bright, uh, upbeat. Uh, picture or visuals on TV and so on. So indeed, uh, the impact could be felt uh, even uh, more considerably in the longer term. And for sure, as it has been reported here in Arirang TV before, the credit card uses have been down about by about 4% in some of the major credit card companies. Mm -hmm. So indeed, the concern is out there. Right. I mean, um, this is, I suppose, it's a way for the nation to show that we're all grieving right. um, with these families together for this just horrible disaster. But right. at the same time, economists have been slowly but cautiously raising the idea that people really uh, need to go back to their daily lives mm -hmm. and so that the economy would pick up pace a little bit. Right, indeed. And indeed. in terms of the economic cycle, mm -hmm. uh, this is not the time that we want to see the economic indicators falling either. Absolutely not, because this is, uh, we are, and uh, seems to, I think a lot of people seem to believe that we are on an upswing side that we've been waiting for, for so long. Let's bring up some numbers here to uh, illustrate that point. Indeed, the quarterly growth here, uh, we've been seeing, for instance, the latest one, uh, right here, we see it right there, 3.9% growth for the first quarter this year is the highest in three years. And in, you, as you can see, the upswing is very, very clear. The pace was fastest between second and third quarter last year, but still the upswing itself is, is indeed happening. And a lot of concerns are out there in terms of like a, what kind of impact this Hewolo, uh, the tragedy will have on the second quarter this year after seeing this you know, encouraging sign for the first quarter. So indeed, the timing is really bad. If indeed there is some kind of impact, uh, a lot of people are uh, hoping that this will be minimized. Now, we have to wonder how, how did uh, past national disasters affect the economy? I mean, Korea has, a, has had a few of those in the past. Right. And what do we see from history? Some of the economists have already uh, checked the numbers so far. And uh, what they have found was, uh, for instance, 1995, Sampung collapse, uh, Sampung uh, department store collapse. After that, somehow that was the, the uh, period of time for Korean economy where we have been experiencing uh, rapid growth. And the, the growth actually indeed continued despite the disaster. And 2003, uh, you know, Daegu subway fire, uh, they checked the numbers. What happened was the year-to-year -year quarterly growth showed increased, even though quarter-to-quarter -quarter growth showed some slowing down. So indeed, the picture is pretty mi mixed here in Korea. But uh, elsewhere around the world, in after 9-1-1 in the United States, we saw their quarter, United States third quarter growth at that time, year 20, uh, 2001, uh, was showing negative growth. So indeed, uh, that's something to keep in mind. And Japanese earthquake uh, back in year uh, 2011, uh, the national economy at that time showed minus 0.8% decrease in terms of their growth. So uh, elsewhere around the world, we've seen some of these uh, negative signs. But then again, we also keep in mind what happened in China and Sichuan uh, earthquake back in 2008 when uh, we saw their growth just continuing on. So uh, consensus is it really all depends. And we don't know what this whole tragedy uh, will fall into which category, having impact or not, I think we need more time. But the sense of nervousness because of the timing itself is indeed quite significant. Well, uh, so uh, the big question is what can economic policymakers do to minimize the possible negative impact? Well, indeed, uh, what happened yesterday was the uh, Vice Minister of uh, uh, Planning, uh, Strategy and uh, Finance, uh, he, uh, Chu Gyeong-ho, mentioned that government is closely watching any possible impact on the economy on this, in this regard. And there's, uh, he was saying the government is considering all the possible options to counter 
if indeed there is, will be some kind of impact. And the governor of Central Bank on the same day yesterday at the same site, uh, he was talking about the same thing, about the uh, Central Bank's readiness to use monetary policy to deal with uh, any kind of impact if indeed there will be any. Uh, so those are the readiness on the side of the government and the uh, relevant authorities. The key question is, however, when the prime minister has announced his uh, resignation, mm -hmm. Uh, the ministers on the economic side, even though we have a deputy prime minister of economy uh, still working very hard, uh, a lot of people are th thinking that government ministries, particularly on the economic policy side, may be uh, on hold, may be put on hold in terms of like uh, wondering about how, what's going to happen to their bosses, for instance, right? Uh, construction, different kinds of land ministry and different kind of economic ministries, uh, you know, uh, marine affairs ministry as well. Uh, when uh, the future of their bosses are uncertain, whether government officials will be working uh, to continue to offer the boost to the economy or not, that's a big question out there. Another big, uh, another important point here is deregulation drive. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to that? Deregulation was deemed very important for job creation and boosting the economy, but now this accident is bringing some kind of new, different kind of picture for so-called deregulation drive. So there, there is another puzzle. I think that is another topic that that is worth covering with Absolutely. you, Dr. Kim byung ju in right. the coming days. Um, how about the deregulation drive by the Park Geun-hye administration? Because right. uh, in light of this accident, they are trying to tighten regulation there. Mm -hmm. So we will have to discuss that issue as well. For sure. All right, Dr. Kim byung ju thank you so much for today. Thank you. And that is all from me at this hour. Thank you for watching. Do join me again at 6 p.m. Korea time on Early Edition at 6.